Okay, are we ready? Well, hi everybody and welcome back to my YouTube channel. And uh, today we are in the historic Mile End Church of Christ, which is part of the uh, Churches of Christ movement, known originally as the Restoration Movement. But that's another whole subject for, for a, a YouTube video. And um, I'd like to introduce you to my good friend, Roger Brown. Welcome, Roger. Thank you, Jeff. And uh, we're going to be interviewing Roger today. And the purpose of our interview is to talk about this recent book that he's produced. It's a booklet, The Tent Mission Era, Churches of Christ in, in South Australia, and uh, 1902 to 1979. And uh, Roger's put in a lot of work into researching this and printing this out. And uh, we're going to talk about that, uh, history of tent missions. We're going to talk a little bit about Roger himself and his background and ministries, what he's doing now, and why did he do the book? So, let's start, Roger. Um, welcome. Thank you. <laughs> and Mary's over there. Thank you for the cups of tea, Mary. Mary's a local identity here at the Mile End Church of Christ. And um, we're going to, uh, first of all, ask Roger a little about his background, um, the ministries he's had, and um, I'll leave that open to you to start off with that. Thanks, Roger. Thanks, Jeff. I'm grateful that I'm here at Mile End. This is the church I went to as a young lad. Is it? I just lived a couple of streets away. Yeah. And my parents sent me over here because there was lots of sport and lots of young people and lots of things happening. <coughs> mm -hmm. I wasn't a Christian, but I came here. This church was literally full with people of all ages. Uh, but the thing that struck me was the church had a history of missions. Mm -hmm. Almost every other year there'd be a mission of some description here in this, this church. It might be a, a mission on uh, the second coming where a preacher would have a big chart out the front and would go for a couple of weeks, uh, or a tent mission. Now, this church is situated on Henley Beach Road, uh, and uh, down Henley Beach Road there were over the years vacant blocks of land. And uh, so this church uh, leased blocks of land, pitched big tents, and had nine tent missions over about a 30-year period. Mm. But when I came here, I became a Christian, was baptised here in the, the church. Uh, after, after high school years, I was working in the bank around South Australia for a year and a bit, and then went to Sydney to train in the Churches of Christ College mm -hmm. uh, on lovely Sydney Harbour at Woolwich uh, for four years. And on graduation, went to the Riverland for four years, Berry, Barmer, Marook, Loxton, Wakery, uh, then back here to Adelaide. I married Judy at that time. She's from Glenelg Church of Christ. And we had a lovely five-year period at Edwardstown. Many, many conversions. Uh, baptisms, I, I think, uh, in the five years, uh, well over 120 uh, baptisms because of the powerful youth ministry that the church had. It was in this time that I conducted a tent mission myself, uh, invited by the Cheltenham Church of Christ. And the, the place they chose was the most difficult part of Adelaide. It was in the heart... Uh, of an, of an area, Mansfield Park, which at that time in the mid 70s was full of uh, crime, violence, uh, uh, domestic abuse, uh, uh, biker gangs. Um, it, it was a terrible area. There were some good people there though. There were a few, yes, there were. <laughs> anyway, the, the, the church pitched this big tent in the heart of Mansfield Park uh, and, and uh, there for two weeks with Pastor Will Philp, who is well known in Churches of Christ, a glorious baritone voice. He was a One of the singer. best singers mm, and also was. a good preacher. So we worked together for two weeks. And that was in 1974, Jeff. Yeah. Uh, and uh, then I went in my ministry after that to Melbourne and uh, then back to uh, Mount Gambia for a couple of churches there, then down to Adelaide, uh, Dulwich Rose Park, uh, and then to, to uh, Hampstead Gardens Church of Christ, uh, then to Semaphore Churches of Christ and then to Black Forest Church of Christ, uh, Mile End Church of Christ and Croydon Church of Christ and Flinders Park Church of Christ. So uh, I've been privileged to meet lots of great people in different churches mm. around this state mm. uh, and, and my brief sojourn in Melbourne was, was delightful uh, as well. Mm. Uh, but now in retirement, I'm discovering a new 
do you, opportunity. Do you think you are actually retired? Uh, no, and I think that's fairly crucial because the um, the tent missioners uh, who were gifted men uh, never knew the word retirement. My observation is they proclaimed the gospel virtually until they dropped. Uh, they had hearts of passion. Um, uh, Will Brooker, one of the most famous tent missioners here in Adelaide, who was familiar all up and down the Port Line, that's the Port Road, there's lots of congregations uh, dotted down the Port Road that he had his finger on and had tent missions at. Um, when he passed away at the age of 72, he was still in his prime occupation of preaching the gospel, organising the, the churches. He was on home missions committee, organising other missions uh, all around the state. And so I've discovered that, yes, we can't have tent missions anymore, but I'm discovering a wonderful delight in visiting residential cares all around Adelaide. I go to six at least on a regular basis. These are nursing homes uh, and Yes, but also uh, people living in independent uh, mm. uh, retirement, common, villages. retirement villages. So mm. uh, the places where I go, half an hour service, uh, people not necessarily totally of uh, nursing home capacity, uh, but a uh, group of people who love to hear the good word of the Bible. And so while the sermon time's limited to about 10 minutes, that's a, a challenge that I enjoy. Uh, and so I'm, I'm delighting in that. I'm on the roster for at least six of them with other retired ministers and people that go into mm. uh, uh, homes to do this. And on occasion, I love going back to churches where I served as pastor mm -hmm. and seeing the people again. And uh, I'm going to a couple... In the, in the next few weeks to Maylands yep. Church and uh, mm -hmm. Colonel, and um, Edwardstown Church of Christ yep. again to renew acquaintances and, mm -hmm. and, and encourage the church mm -hmm. uh, as I do here at Mile End, come back occasionally and uh, uh, the other congregation at Flinders Park to uh, pray that they continue in their faithfulness and work of the gospel. So uh, I, I couldn't imagine myself doing anything in retirement. I'm 77 now. Uh, doctors have kept me in good health, praise God. And you've just had a cataract. Oh, you? yes, I can see you all clearly through the lens of this <laughs> camera. Uh, and uh, and uh, like many of these uh, great missioners, uh, delight to serve the kingdom and Jesus and to proclaim his good uh, words for as long as I can. Mm -hmm. One of the ministers of this church, Pastor Barry Benz, well known to Mary who's here, I just was in touch with him recently. He's in his 90s now and he... Uh, He's still pastor uh, at Gatton Church in, in Queensland. Now, he left this church in 2004, I think, Mary, uh, and he went to alleged retirement into Queensland. He's still preaching regularly at a church since so almost uh, 20 years. Mm. So, and, and when I last talked to him, he said, as long as I've got breath, I'll proclaim the gospel of our Lord Jesus in whatever way I can. and But he and Elka still have holidays and lovely times with their family mm. and friends, so you're not engaged full-time, but it's part of your life. Mm. And I couldn't imagine part of my life not including an opportunity to share the good news of Jesus. Thank you. There you go. That was quite a summary. Wonderful. <laughs> and uh, one of my heroes, well, I suppose he's not a Church of Christ person, but you know, we all look up to John Wesley, and yes. I read that he was actually, um, uh, the last sermon he preached, he was actually being held up on either side by two men holding him up so he could stand up in the pulpit, and he died the following week. <laughs> what a wonderful <laughs> was story. Amazing, amazing person, him and his brother, of course. So thank you for that, Roger. And um, what's happening here? Oh, nothing. We can ignore that. That was just... Um, a message from Centrelink to me. <laughs> <laughs> We're all under the authority <laughs> of the government. <laughs> Telling me that there's a letter for me to look at on, on the internet. That'll so be exciting. That's interesting. Thanks for spotting that. Hello, Centrelink. <laughs> anyway, um, thank you for that. It's just, just throwing me off my uh, next question. So the next question is, why this book? Why did you write this book? And uh, tell us about that and, and how, how you come to do it. Uh, well, Jeff, this... <coughs> This is not actually a book. It's a compilation, more like a magazine, a snapshot, a pictorial snapshot of Churches of Christ tent missions here in South Australia. Um, a colleague of mine, Dennis Nutt, who I roomed with in college in, in Woolwich, Sydney, he's now still 
he doesn't know the word retirement. He's nearly 90 and he's associate professor at the Churches of Christ College in uh, New South Wales, okay. still, still lecturing at and he's a prolific writer. Mm -hmm. Well, he wrote the story of E.C. Hendrickson, one of Australia's greatest tent missioners. Uh, he wrote this about a year or two ago and included five other major tent missioners from New South Wales and Victoria. Uh, and he published this book. And uh, the age of special evangelism, he called it, the tent mission era. Uh, but he didn't cover a lot of South Australian history uh, about it. So after I read the book and rang Dennis, he said, well, his book focused on mainly experiences in New South Wales and Victoria. So I thought, well, there's a challenge. If anyone's going to do some looking at South Australia, it'll have to be me, because to my knowledge, I'm the only surviving tent missioner here in South Australia at the moment. There is one other uh, surviving evangelist, that's uh, Pastor Philip Stevens, who's living in retirement at Wangaratta. Mm. All other tent missioners have passed away on to glory. Mm. So I thought, where do I begin? Uh, so I went to the State Library and accessed the Australian National Print Archives, where up until the year 1954, you could access every newspaper and every article uh, in them. And, and you can type in on your search engine what you're looking for. So I typed in the words, Tent Missions, Churches of Christ, South Australia. And up came a whole raft of wonderful articles, photographs, uh, articles by journalists, uh, ad advertisements by churches of tent missions. I had no idea of the extent of this activity, no idea whatsoever. I, I wouldn't have hazarded a guess as to how many missions were conducted, had mm. absolutely no idea. As a result of my uh, investigations and researching all of the newspapers in South Australia, uh, these, this summary is, is really accurate. Uh, over 180 180 tent missions conducted by 51 different churches of Christ here in South Australia uh, with over 3,000 conversions and, to my knowledge, 40 evangelists, different evangelists at work. Uh, an era of great joy. So that was my discovery and I'm of the belief that when I documented this, no one else had made the same discovery. So it was original research which I formulated into this booklet, which has now been circulating among the ministers and churches here in South Australia. It, it purely is a, uh, a navigation through the newspapers. It's, it's presented as a magazine of photographs, articles, some great pictures of the early evangelists, mm. uh, lots of delightful photographs of tent missions actually being used in the 1930s and 40s, 50s by churches around South Australia. So I got really excited doing this every time I would go into the archives uh, and punch in some information, maybe the name of an evangelist or a church location, up would come newspaper articles uh, about uh, the missions that were conducted. In some cases, a good photograph in these uh, old newspapers. Hmm. So that, that's how the book was evolved. I was very careful to acknowledge on the back that this is purely uh, a navigation through the newspapers, what the journalists were saying uh, and uh, and how the churches advertised these missions. So it wasn't presented as a textbook on uh, theological expression through tent mission gospel evangelism, uh, but purely a record of what the newspapers said. Um, there, there are some church historical booklets like centenary booklets or jubilee booklets that I found in the Churches of Christ archives that also had good photographs and, and descriptions, but they were fairly brief. Uh, they didn't appear in great detail in the history booklets mm -hmm. of the churches. Uh, and the newspaper line of Churches of Christ is called the Australian Christian. And they did include coverage of many of these uh, missions, but not, not, not in abundance. Hmm. particularly in South Australia. So uh, it was from the newspapers of South Australia that the information came for this booklet, hmm. which has just been produced yeah. and uh, circulated. Yeah, well done. Um, at the end of the interview, we'll talk about how you can get a copy of this, which will probably be through me by contacting me. It'll be the best way to do it, but I'll uh, make mention of that in the notes underneath the video. So... <coughs> 
What about, uh, who are some of the key people that were involved in these tent missions? Can you talk about that? Oh, I can. For me, it was a personal discovery. And my discovery focused on the incredible dedication and persevering, persevering conviction that these evangelists were chosen by God primarily and made available to churches of Christ in South Australia to conduct tent missions. Uh, my observation is this is a unique gift, uh, a unique opportunity. Of course, that era is, is completed now and replaced by other strategies used by churches, ministers and evangelists. There are still one or two tent missions, I think, happening around Australia, maybe one at least yes, still yes. going. I went to one about three or four years ago Good. up in the Riverland, actually, an independent little yes, group that was yes, doing it. That, yes. was, that was wonderful. Yes. Mm. The value of a tent, Jeff, mm. is it's on public ground generally mm. uh, that makes people feel safe. They, they can go into a tent that looks a bit like a circus tent, uh, but there's no circus animals or, or entertainment inside. But by going into a tent, people would feel, we're on public territory. If, if I feel threatened or I don't like it or a bit awkward, I can just get up and go without mm. drawing attention to myself. Mm. Unlike going into a church. And in the 1930s and 40s, there was a perception that the church building which was the worshipping place for Christian people, there was largely respectability and, and uh, a, a degree of uh, uh, not so much importance, but people who went to church got dressed up, they wore hats, Sunday best, collars and ties, and, and people, if they didn't want to do that, felt a bit uncomfortable. Hmm. So in a tent, you could go dress however you like. Yep. And I think this was the great value of the tent mission. Anyone hmm. could go there. Uh, and uh, and so and there was no cost generally, there were no offering plates being passed around except on the end, and I'll talk about that uh, mm. a little later. Uh, so I, I feel it was a, a time that was right. Will Brooker, we're here at Mile End, and between Mile End and Hindmarsh and Semaphore, all the way up Port Road here in Adelaide, there's a series of locations where Will Brooker conducted tent missions very strongly and passionately. I think about 15 or 16. As a result of these tent missions, churches were established at Croydon, uh, at uh, uh, Semaphore, at uh, Albert Park and Cheltenham, directly as a consequence of these missions. There was enough people who made commitments to Jesus Christ and were baptised to form the nucleus of a, a new little congregation. Mm -hmm. So Will Brooker stands out in my uh, mind uh, very, very passionately, see. And uh, there were other great uh, preachers uh, who were part of our conference. Uh, P.R. Baker uh, was a gifted man who came from Victoria, had lots of tent missions in Tasmania. Uh, at one, uh, attracting 900 people per night uh, in his massive tent in uh, Hobart. Uh, so P.R. Baker conducted many churches. He was a minister of the Norwood Church of Christ for a while, a uh, strong association with Great Street, and Hindmarsh, uh, very gifted uh, preacher. And yet, when the tent mission era completed, he went to Victoria and conducted several successful just church uh, ministries uh, very passionately. In, in, in the book, we have a listing here of every church and including details let's, let's of... Just hold it up. There's yeah, a great long list there. Uh, details in this book of each church, the, the year of the tent mission and who the evangelist was. There are 40 different evangelists listed there. Uh, some of them did, uh, Pastor Will Byler conducted uh, many. Uh, some of them were appointed state tent missioners here in South Australia. The conference at the time recognised the value of tent mission outreach and so the Home Mission Department engaged several of these missioners, not all at once, uh, to be full-time. The conference bought a big tent and it tracked all around South Australia, in the suburbs, in the city and in regional areas with uh, one of these tent missioners whose sole responsibility in their year of service was to conduct tent missions. Mm. It took a fair bit of time. Mm. The preparation and organising took a fair bit of time and then the missions sometimes went for three, sometimes four weeks uh, and, and then there was the follow-up afterwards. So it was fairly intense. And so out intense, of the... Intense, intense and intense. Intense, intense Sorry, in I had to tents. get that one in, That's right. Roger. <laughs> so uh, 40 different evangelists, 
uh, all chosen because of their ability to conduct strong meetings in a tent. Uh, my understanding is that they were selected uh, for this role with confidence that they were able to conduct meetings sometimes for three weeks straight, almost every night of the week, mm. and be stimulating and interesting so that people mm. didn't get bored, uh, attracted newcomers who didn't have a church background. They had to have special uh, training. Now, in my case, my special training in, in Sydney was that during the course of my college training, the students were taken into Hyde Park lunch times by the college principal. And we had to stand up on Speaker's Corner, which is still available today, and try and hold an audience for five minutes, which was very challenging. So did you do that? I did that. Yeah. I was, wow. Every student had to do that. Uh, and, and in front of hundreds of people having their lunch, sitting down in Hyde Park, feeding the pigeons, someone would stand up in the corner and wax forth on a certain topic or whatever and bring Jesus or the gospel into it. Mm. It was quite demanding. There, there were hecklers and people who criticised you and some uh, threw other words at you to put you off. Uh, it was quite a training ground. Mm. And, and the principal assessed mm. the students afterwards on how they were able to conduct uh, this, this training. It was part of what we called our homiletics training, training in preparation and conduct <coughs> of uh, sermons, mm. uh, ministries uh, and outreach. So I myself, along with uh, several, I won't say all Church of Christ pastors, had a strong grounding in being able to preach largely without notes uh, mm -hmm. uh, to, to an audience and engage them personally and try and retain that, um, that connection. Mm. And I think most of the, the tent missioners, my observation is that they were able to do this. There's, in the book, there's reports from some of the journalists who went to these missions, who were sitting there with their notebooks during the mission, who wrote down what they observed. And, and so they were men who were able to, to do that. They had good, strong voices. They spoke clearly. Uh, there was no amplification in those days, no uh, microphones or cameras. Um, fairly basic. Some mm. of the photographs in the booklet show what it was like inside these tents. Mm. Very basic, just wooden mm. chairs out, a, a <coughs> piano on the stage, uh, a pulpit and a few chairs. And that was it. They had a baptistry though, in them? Well, they did. Yep. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, the, the Junior Christian Endeavour Societies of South Australia, Churches of Christ, raised money in one year, there's a story of this in the book, to buy a portable gas-powered baptistry available for tent missions. And they were taken to wherever... The gas being to make the water warm. That's right. The yeah. water had to be warm. Yeah. And, and so these were available in the tents. And so people could make their commitment to Christ one night, and if they liked, the following night or soon afterwards could be baptised, but generally by the minister of the local church. Mm. Uh, the evangelist normally didn't take part, stood there and prayed, mm. and the local minister conducted the baptisms and one of the elders welcomed them into the fellowship mm. of the church. Mm. All of this was conducted in the tent. Mm. Can I, I just uh, butt in a, a fraction there? Uh, I'm conscious there's people all around the world watching this who aren't necessarily Christians. Oh, right. Some will be from other denominations. So right. just a word of explanation in in churches of Christ, um, it's always been practiced, well, not right at the start, but it's, it's uh, not long after the church movement started off, back in America and Scotland and England, I think it had its roots, didn't it? Um, uh, baptism, believers' baptism became part of our basic doctrine and beliefs, where um, baptism was by a total immersion and only by a person who had believed in Jesus Christ and also repented of sin. And therefore, that's why the baptistry was there, to allow people, if they wanted to be baptised that night or the next night, they could. So that's just a bit of an explanation. Of course, we're aware that other people in other denominations don't practise what we do. But that's something that's worth investigating to see why we do it. Thanks, Roger. Sorry. Yeah. So, in answer to your original question, there was a, a whole listing of evangelists. I would say myself that about seven of these evangelists conducted... Uh, at least 10, 10, 10 missions. Uh, they were specially gifted, they were extremely dedicated, they worked incredibly hard uh, over the course of each of these 10 missions. The, the, the time that they would put into each mission was unbelievable, not just turning up on the night to preach a message at the given time in the tent, but the working with the church, the pastors, the elders, 
before and during. Most of these evangelists had a, what you would call a deputy who may have been the song leader or campaign manager who worked with the local church and the local pastor and elders in the preparation and conduct. A lot of work went into it. But the, the tent missioner, during the daytime, would go with the local pastor to visit homes of, of contacts, people who were curious about the gospel or wanted questions answered. And, and, and so the tent missioner, instead of going out on the golf course during the daytime or having a hit of tennis, uh, would go out with the minister knocking on doors and talking to people down the street, in the, in the coffee places uh, or in, the, in their homes. Um, it, it was a very arduous time, but they were so dedicated, they threw their whole heart and soul in, into it. Mm. You, you were just talking to me earlier about that uh, it took its toll on some of these people. Can you just expand on that a little bit? Yes, my, my observation is that they lab, laboured strongly and passionately but there's no clear evidence of um, them when you're coming to the end of their ministries uh, of having what would be a comfortable retirement. Uh, I use those words carefully. They very rarely had superannuation or the ability to have enough money and savings to buy a modest little home to retire into. My observation is that largely, predominantly, they lived in accommodation rented, maybe housing commission or, or public housing uh, units uh, available, or in a lot of cases, their children would buy a little unit uh, for mum and dad and they would live there and pay them the rent. And, and that still happens today. Mm. Uh, so uh, they lived for the heart of the gospel, not for financial reward. Uh, now, at the end of every tent mission crusade, there was one offering only taken, and that was called a thank offering. Uh, this offering was widely publicised among the, the Christians, the members of the churches connected, and the only offering taken was generally on the Sunday morning at the conclusion of the tent mission, where the Christian people gave generously to cover all the costs. Uh, my indication... Uh, well, here... Here on the front page of the booklet, we've got a report from a tent mission in Balaclava. That's a country town about 50 kilometres, oh, no, 100 kilometres north of Adelaide. Mm -hmm. uh, and this, this headline says, thank offering of £64 at the last mission meeting, 25 baptisms in five weeks. And the year of that, Jeff, was? 1940, April 1940. So in April 1940, this massive thank offering of £64 covered all the expenses and, and paid a, a remuneration to the tent missioner. Which at the time of decimal conversion would have been $128. Yes, except for inflation back in that yeah, day. That's, that's right. right. So uh, that's the way they survived. Now, you'll appreciate that the tent missioners didn't go from one tent mission campaign directly to another one. Sometimes there was a, a gap of a couple of months. Uh, some of the tent missioners were then invited guests of some of the churches to give special teaching missions or, or, or preaching. But my observation, and it's not widespread or conclusive, is that generally they focused on the tent mission activity and in later years um, were able to have a pastorate of a small church mm. some, somewhere. And how blessed were those people mm. uh, to have the, the gifted ministry of, of a, uh, a much blessed uh, tent mission evangelist who would then mm. spend time with the local, mm. local church. Uh, can, can I, at that yeah. point, maybe talk about E.C. Henriksen? Oh, yes. And E.C. Yes. Um, uh, e. Henriksen was a famous uh, Church of Christ preacher and tent missioner. Probably he was the most prolific of them all, possibly. And um, his daughter, Lucy, actually, uh, I knew at our church many years ago. She's been gone a long time now. Uh, but uh, he actually collapsed during uh, one of his addresses. There's a story about it on here, on the front page, if you can just see there. And um, when I um, mentioned that Roger had done this um, book a few weeks ago to a, um, a person who uh, got in touch with me through my blog where I'd written about tent missions and churches of Christ, um, he told me that he his um, father used to be a, a, a minister at the Ch Grote Street Church of Christ where I used to go, but and his name is Charles Swab. Charles Swab Jr. is the man that got in touch with me. Mm. And Charles told me that he was actually at this meeting yes. 
when E.C. Henriksen collapsed. And Charles, I think, correct me when I contact you, Charles, um, told me that he became a Christian um, at that meeting mm. when he collapsed. So can you just talk a yes. bit more about that? Yes, I found this story in the newspaper. Uh, that story's continued in the book. This was E.C. Henriksen's final tent mission meeting. He collapsed in that meeting, taken to hospital, serious heart condition. Just keep talking, Roger. I just got to turn that other camera on. <laughs> it took a long while for him to recover. Went back to New South Wales to his home church at Carrigbar, where after a while he resumed a faithful ministry there, uh, part time, until his, finally he passed away a couple of years later. But this particular meeting in the Gawler Church of Christ was his final uh, campaign sermon. A book has been released called The Gospel Under Canvas, which contains at least 12 of his most popular gospel sermons. There are some copies around. I'm not sure if they're available for sale, uh, mm -hmm. but in the State Archives, there's a few copies of The Gospel I have a under copy gospel. of I've got my yes, own copy. Uh, very mm. inspiring. Uh, very <coughs> inspiring. So E.C. Henriksen conducted tent missions, not only all across Australia, and he had successful missions in every state of the Commonwealth uh, here, in, here in Australia. He also had successful campaigns in, in uh, America and in Great Britain as well, uh, used to go overseas in the 1940s uh, to proclaim to very large congregations. He was a fierce, strong ambassador for Jesus in the public pulpits. He, he had a wonderful ministry. Uh, I was not able to hear him personally. I've heard a recording of one of his sermons and even that has given me the information that uh, once you went to a, a tent mission meeting with E.C. Henriksen, you, you had to go back night after night after night. This church mile in had uh, Pastor Henriksen on two occasions, two very big missions down Hindley Beach Road, just near where I'm sitting right here today. At one of these tent missions, uh, 1928, he had this massive tent that seated about 320 or 30 people. It was full and there were 100 outside, so they had to organise a second tent to pitch behind it and connect it together. So it made one big tent and the record states that over 700 people attended that every night. 700, Mary, every night for a couple of weeks. And there Scores of people made commitments to Jesus Christ and then were, became members of the church. So E.C. Henriksen had a strong, attractive power to the way he proclaimed the gospel. He had a strong voice. He characterised his sermons with good anecdotes and stories, good biblical analysis, and most importantly, at most meetings, outlined clearly the steps to becoming a Christian. This was one of the secrets of a good tent mission evangelist as much as possible to outline how simple the steps are on the road to salvation through Jesus Christ. To make that clear and also to make sure that people knew that before they left to go home they had an opportunity of making this decision or at least talking to people about it before they left the building. So there was an urgency uh, about the proclamations, uh, a very critical urgency uh, like a compulsion and, and this fed over into the people that went to the tents to hear these evangelists. They felt they had to go back the next night and the night after. Now to be fair, here in Adelaide in South Australia in this era of tent missions, uh, there was little competition for evening attention. No television, the radio broadcasts were a bit sparse, uh, newspapers were small print, hard to read. Uh, the theatres offered movies, uh, but they were expensive to go to. You had to save up. And the hotels, there were six o'clock closings. So, so after six o'clock at night, no hotels or clubs or pubs. So basically, the appeal of a tent mission campaign with good and bright music and singing, and sometimes they had testimonies of uh, interesting people who had a, a, a very strong conversion, would tell their story, giving a testimony. That was appealing. And so people were attracted this, to this form of meeting. Um, and so the Tent Mission Crusades uh, had little to compete with the, the time. Supermarkets weren't open. Uh, no, there was, 
it seems to me there was just the movie theatre that was open of an evening that people could go to if they wished. Hmm. Thank you for that. I guess we're coming towards the end of... We've covered a fair bit of the material that we talked about earlier. Um, you talked about before about all the uh, conversions and all that sort of stuff, and, and uh, I know a few weeks ago in our backyard church at Barry's Place, <laughs> which uh, we've been doing because of the... Uh, um, my wife and I are involved at the Park Rose nursing home and normally before COVID we would be involved in a, a church service in their actual hall but then because we weren't allowed to go in there with the independent people including myself um, we actually started having meetings in a backyard and uh, of one of our friends and Roger's been along a few times and spoken it's been a bit like a tent mission hasn't it we had a, an awning up above us uh, which bit like was quite a, tent. a bit like a tent and a few weeks back, Roger actually um, gave an address pretending he was in one of these missions, tent missions at Mansfield Park, and That's gave right. us a sample of what it was like, yes. which was very good and well done. But I just thought, Roger, I know this is putting you on the spot a bit. There's lots of people out here, out there watching this, and maybe not thousands, but there will be some watching this who aren't Christians, and they would be maybe even anti-Christian but they don't know what we're talking about when we talk about being converted and all that sort of stuff. Are you able to summarise, just in a few words, what the invitation would be and what the steps were that you mentioned earlier that people would take if they wanted to become a Christian? Can you do that? Yes, yeah, certainly. The tent missioner had to do this every night. Uh, every night the tent missioner would assume that this could be the last time a person might hear about Jesus or God or faith or... or impact on their life. So one of the characteristics would be that every night the missioner would explain simply and concisely what believing in Jesus uh, meant. That, that there was the aspect that on Easter, Good Friday, Jesus died on the cross in our place to be the substitute for all the sin of everyone in the whole world. That the punishment for sin would fall on his shoulders alone and through his death, we could all be forgiven. Our sin could be placed on him when he died on the cross 2,000 years ago. And of course, he rose on Easter Sunday, a great glorious event. So he rose to prove that the power of God was working in that great moment, the very first, what you would call Easter. And, and as a result of that, uh, that became known as the gospel, the good news that God through Christ has done something to take away the blemish and the stain of human sin and failure uh, and, and to provide new beginning of hope, um, the blessing of God in a life, the gift of eternal life, which means that even when we come to the end of life and pass away, we will go immediately into the presence of God and Jesus and live eternally with him. That's the hope. But for people to be a part of that journey means a recognition that Jesus died in their place. Jesus died for me, for every single person in the world. The, f the fact remains that people have to respond. It's not automatic. We have to accept that Jesus died for us to believe that fact and say to the Heavenly Father, thank you that your son died in my place. I accept what he did. I confess my sin and accept your loving forgiveness and the hope you give to me now and I believe in him and will follow him for the rest of my life. And that becomes part of a journey. That journey involves the Holy Spirit, God's presence that comes into a life to provide that inner strength of spiritual security that we have. And then we simply go to the Bible to follow all the things Jesus said and did and taught us how to live uh, as members of his kingdom. And so every tent missioner would make this choice clear every single time that there was a meeting, mainly at night, and, and uh, people could come forward. Now, that coming forward, I think, is a useful technique. It's not in the Bible, but it's a useful technique of leaving your seat, walking to the front of the meeting, where the tent missioner would step down from the pulpit take them by the hand, shake them by the hand and say, God bless you. 
and someone from the church, maybe an elder or a pastoral keeper, would come out, stand with that person and maybe put their arm around their shoulder and after we have a little prayer with them, sit down, show them from the Bible, the value of believing in Christ and then deal with the consequences from that point. So by coming forward, it, it makes a public decision. In other words, it's, it's an open public confession. Uh, tent missioners like to use the stories in the Bible of some of the great Christian conversions of people that did it publicly. Most of the evidence indicates that people were identified by publicly believing in Jesus and becoming a member of a congregation. And so it, it, there is the place for a quiet personal faith, but also the strong place for declaring this to your members of your family, uh, friends, I have decided to become a follower of Jesus. It doesn't mean that I lose touch with what I'm doing or the things I'm engaged in, but there is a new spiritual reality in my life that I intend following. And that's going to make a great difference in my life. Uh, and, and so for me personally, I, I would make that strong uh, appeal. I've done it in churches where I've served as minister, but particularly in the tent missions, that appeal has to be made very clear every night of every mission. Thank you, Roger. I became a Christian by responding to that type of an appeal from a minister in uh, the Great Street Church of Christ back in about 1974, I think it was. I was 28. Now I'm a little bit older than that. I'm not too far behind Roger. He's got a couple of years on me at this stage, but, uh, but I um, have no regrets at all about taking that step. And, uh, but it took me about three years of listening to very good preaching before I decided to follow Jesus, so to speak. And it's been a fantastic journey. Not to say that there's not some ups and downs, because there certainly are lots of challenges, but there's nothing that, that uh, God won't help you through and uh, take you through. And his Holy Spirit is working within us all the time. So I think it's probably a good time to wind up here, Roger. That's been very informative. Um, what I'll uh, do is... Um, I'll put some more information underneath. I've written about tent missions on my blog before, so I'll put some links to that underneath as well, and also some links to some work about Will Brooker, who Roger was mentioning, was an amazing Christian man and photographer and preacher and tent missioner and whatever, and, and I've actually got some articles about him on my blog as well. So thanks heaps, Roger, for coming today. Pleasure. That's been really good. And uh, I know Mary's enjoyed it, I think. And thank you for opening up the church for us, Mary, and, and bringing us a cup of tea each. And um, so what I usually do at this stage in these um, videos, Roger, it might sound a bit corny, but I say um, thanks for watching, everyone. Um, like if you wish and sub subscribe if you want to. And I'll see you next time. See you later. Cheerio.